open the, the word of God for us. Thank you all for joining this morning. And again, it is a great privilege to be able to share just a short word from, from God's word. It's lovely to see all the faces. And again, we bring with you the greetings from the assembly at Takapuna this morning. Now, the last time we were with you, we were thinking of that great moment in the Apostle Peter's life when the Lord Jesus Christ called him to be fishers of men. And we enjoyed some of those thoughts, recognizing the importance of the Savior and uh, the new work which he would have for the Apostle Peter. And uh, towards the end of our message, we found that Peter, uh, with those with him, they left all and they followed Christ. They left their boats and they left their nets and they left their ships and they followed him. The Lord said to Peter, I will make you fishers of men. You know, Peter up to that stage was used to catching live fish. And when they entered the net and were pulled out well, they died. Of course, the Lord was going to teach Peter somewhat new. He was going to now catch men, men who are dead in trespasses and sin, but of course to be made alive in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to take you to the very fulfillment of this promise the Lord made to Peter in the outworking of his commitment to following Christ and, and leading all. I want you to turn with me to Acts chapter number two, please. Acts chapter number two. <clears throat> We want to read some scattered verses here in Acts chapter 2 and trust it will be a blessing to you as it has been to me. Acts chapter 2 and I want to read verse number 14. We were thinking of Peter last time and following Christ and being fishers of men and here on the day of Pentecost we read at uh, in Acts 2 verse 14 but Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. Down to verse 22, please. Peter still speaking, he says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles, and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as he yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, he have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Now over to verse, or down to verse number 37. We're going to read the response here to the audience in Peter's day. Verse 37, now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and he shall receive, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 41, please. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all uh, that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had needed. 
And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house to eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and adding favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now the Lord always blesses the public reading of his most holy and precious word. A really, really exciting part of scripture. And it really uh, interests us. And as we look back at this great moment, and we call it the, the birth of the church. It's really wonderful to know that, again, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who always, uh, 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 his word is always true. We can take God at his word. Remember the Lord Jesus asked his disciples on an occasion, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? And we remember that tremendous answer by Peter, whom we've been thinking about. He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And we remember the response on that occasion of the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, man, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my father, which is in heaven. And then the Lord Jesus was going to tell Peter of something new something hidden from the old, something he was going to do. And he says, now listen, on the basis of what you said, that Christ is the son of God and the work at the cross of Calvary says, I will build my church. And so here was something revealed to Peter on this occasion about what Christ was doing. He was going to build a church. Here's something future on that occasion that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was going to build a church. Now, brethren and sisters and dear friends, we don't find the church in the Old Testament. The Lord never said to Peter, I have been building my church for generations and generations. No, here's something new. Here he says, I will build my church. Of course, we know the history. We know how indeed, as our brother has been mentioning, the Lord Jesus Christ was nailed to that old rugged cross. There as the perfect sacrifice. There as the one who was willing to lay down his life to pay the price and the penalty for our sin. Of course, here on Pentecost, we're going to see the very co the commencement of the church, which he had promised to Peter that he was going to build. Now, it's interesting. To read about the early church, you know, we're living some 2000 years later, and I think that sometimes, well, over this long period of time, we've, we've changed so much that we forget the very principles of the early church. And this should be um, a, a pattern, and this should be a desire that indeed we might continue to be just like the early church. You know, it is the same God of whom they serve. And they had such great results and God had blessed them. And we want to go and look at this early church here at Pentecost. We want to look at, at, at the members of this church. We want to look at the mannerisms. We want to look at some things that are found in this lovely few verses that we have read. I'm gonna want to look very firstly at the repentance and their faith. You know, Peter, on this occasion, as he speaks to these men of Israel and women of Israel, he's going to stand up, as we read in verse, verse 14, Peter standing up with the 11. And what is he going to do? As he views these Israelites here on this occasion, what is he going to do? He is going to preach the gospel. Brethren and sisters, dear friends here this morning, this is the purpose of uh, our testimony for him that we might tell men and women, boys and girls, concerning the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Peter was faithful to his, his brethren here. He stands up and he presents the Lord Jesus Christ as the one who was approved of God, the sent one, and the one who was, was, de was, was, was delivered by the determined counsels and full knowledge of God and how he was slain and put on a cross and how God raised him from the dead. Brethren and sisters, this is 
the gospel that we are need to be, we need to be preaching. There are men and women, boys and girls, on their way to a lost eternity. They need to be saved. Let's be like Peter. Let's stand up, as it were, and preach Christ crucified. You know, we're living in a very strange world. We're living in a world that entertains, isn't it? And uh, the world loves entertainment. You put up a rugby match and you'll get 50,000 people in with ease. All right? Brethren and sisters, the world loves entertainment. As believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, as New Testament assembly, we need to recognize the importance of standing up and telling men and women that they need to be saved. They don't need entertainment, right? That's good. We enjoy that. But we need to recognize the importance of preaching the gospel. And here, Peter recognizes that in his call to be fishers of men. But what was the result? We read in verse 37 that as they heard the gospel, they were pricked in their heart. They were pricked in their heart. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who convicts men of sin, of righteousness to come, judgment and righteousness to come. And, uh, and what was the response to the preaching of the gospel? We read in verse 41. Here's their response. Then they that gladly received his word. I'm going to suggest that as we look at the early members of the early church, we're going to see within them repentance and faith in Christ. They repented of the sin. The Bible says that there is no difference. No difference between the Greek and the Jew. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It is our, our nature, isn't it? We're born in sin and shaped in iniquity. And the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And that's the very reason why the Christ of God came to pay the price and the penalty for your sin and for my sin. And this is what Peter preached. And they were pricked in their hearts. And it says they, they, they responded to the preaching of the gospel. And it says then they that gladly received his word. They were marked by repentance, a turning away from their sin. And faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder if I can ask our audience. I don't know you individually. Have you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your own and personal savior? All right. This is how you become a Christian. Not because we're a member of a church. Not because we're perhaps we were baptized as infants. That doesn't make us a Christian. A Christian, dear friends, this morning is one who has put their personal faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. What have we said? Lord, you died there at the cross of Calvary for my sin. You paid the price and the penalty for my sin. And I rest my all. I put my faith in the finished work at the cross of Calvary, recognizing that God, the just, is satisfied to look upon the Lord Jesus Christ and to pardon me. I trust everyone knows of a moment in their life's experience when they came to trust him as their own and personal savior. These members of this early church, they were marked by repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then they that gladly received his word, they were marked by repentance and faith in Christ. But then secondly, we read of the early church here on this occasion that they were not only marked by faith and repentance, but they were marked by responsiveness and following. We read there then they that gladly received his word, they were baptized. Here is responsiveness and the following. Yes, they were Christians by trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, repentance and faith in Christ. But it didn't end there. They were going to be responsive to the very command of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ said that we needed to be baptized. And, and this marks the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ outwardly identifying ourselves with the Christ of God who went into death. 
who was buried and who was raised again from amongst the dead ones. And so here are some marks of the early church. They were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ and they were going to respond to the word of God and follow Christ. And they were going to say, as we sing, where he may lead, I will go. You know, dear friends, the word of God teaches us about believers' baptism. Believers' baptism. Remember that Ethiopian eunuch, when Philip spoke to him, he read to him the scriptures. He understood the scriptures. And then he asked the question, what, what is hindering me from being baptized? And Philip said to him on occasion, if thou believest, there's no hindrance. Dear friends, I trust that everyone here who is a Christian is baptized. The Bible doesn't envisage unbaptized believers. Now, don't get me wrong. Baptism doesn't save us. Faith in Christ saves us. But every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ needs to respond to the word of God and to follow Christ and to be obedient to his command to be baptized. The Bible doesn't envisage baptized unbelievers. That's why we don't baptize infants, because they can't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The word of God teaches believers baptize, baptism, and they that gladly receive this word, they believe they were baptized. And so repentance and faith, they gladly received this word. Responsiveness and following, they were baptized in obedience to God's word. But then thirdly, we want to look at reception and fellowship. We read in those lovely verses there that they continued, sorry, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. What a wonderful meeting that was. Here there was reception and fellowship. You know, when you and I are saved, when we trust the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, well, we, we added immediately to the church universal. At the moment of salvation, we are added to the church of God. Isn't that wonderful? No matter where we come from, no matter where our background is, no matter where and how big sinners we are, the minute we trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, dear friends, we are added to the church universal. But then there's also the local church, the local assembly. And this is a fellowship. And uh, uh, for you, locally is Kalkapla, isn't it? And you're added to a church locally. And, and here's going to speak about reception and fellowship to that church. We're going to be received to a fellowship. A little fellowship, a little company of the Lord's people, a company raised for many, many years to be a testimony for God's honor and for God's glory. Now, here in comes a responsibility. All right. We don't really become members of a local church. We are added and received into the fellowship. Now, what does it mean to have fellowship? If you read through the scriptures, you'll find that there is fellowship in the gospel. We read that there's fellowship in suffering. We read that there's fellowship in the spirit. We read that there's fellowship amongst the servants of God. What does it mean? As we are part of a local fellowship, we are there both to enjoy the joys of the fellowship, the sorrows of the fellowship, and we are part of every activity connected to that fellowship. All right? Therein bears a responsibility. That when we come to a local assembly and a local fellowship, well, we're not just there as a passenger. We should be there as a partner, working together in fellowship, in building, in preaching, whenever God has called us to do locally, whether it be opening the door, whether it be putting out the books, whether it be putting out the water, to be involved in the local fellowship. Now, we're going to read about that further on, and you can go read right through the Acts, how that they were involved in the sufferings and the fellowships and the joys. In fact, on this occasion, they felt so much for each other, they sold all their possessions uh, to help one another. 
this is reception and fellowship. And that day there was added to the church about 3,000 souls. Mind you, dear friends, the Lord Jesus Christ, he spoke about where two or three are gathered together into my name, there am I in the midst. And so the fellowship can be very small, but we have this divine promise that we two or three are gathered together into my name. There am I in the midst of it. Let's not look to numbers, all right? Numbers is not a yardstick for, for, for great works per se, or a level of spirituality. The Lord said we two or three, having been gathered together into and unto my name, there am I in the midst of them. And so we had repentance and faith, responsiveness and following, reception and fellowship. I trust every one of us knows what it means to be involved in somewhat or the other, in supporting the oversight, in supporting the assembly, that we might be a testimony in our local area. But then, of course, we want to look at the responsibility and their faithfulness. The, this early church, they recognized that they had a responsibility and we want to look at their faithfulness in the local church, in that early church. We read there that these that really received these word, they were baptized, yes, and they were added to the church. And then we read there that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and the fellowship and in breaking of bread and prayers. I want to suggest that this early church, they knew somewhat of the responsibility of obeying and keeping to the word of God. And we look at the faithfulness to the word of God. You know, if I look at my life, I ask the Lord just to allow me to be faithful to his word. We're not looking for greatness. We just want to be faithful and to be able to say with the apostle Paul, I have kept the faith. I've finished my course. Brethren and sisters, this early church, they were marked by faithfulness and they recognized there is a responsibility of keeping to God's word. It says they continued steadfastly. And that's the link to faithfulness. All right? We must be steadfast in our service for him. We must be steadfast in our Christian pathway to him. It's wonderful to see all those again, despite the restriction, despite the difficulties faced, to be steadfast in our gathering together to remember the Lord Jesus Christ. They continued steadfastly. Now, what were they faithful at? We read there, they will continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, in the apostles' teaching, in the teaching of the apostles. Now, we have the word of God in our hands. We often quote that it's the inspired word of God, breathed by God himself, used men to pin these words, but we recognize it is not men's words per se, it is God's word. From Genesis all the way to Revelation, it is God's word. Now, as a local church, the early church year, and we as a local church to apply it to our own lives, we have a responsibility, dear friends and brethren and sisters in Christ, to obey the word of God. You know, we often use that quote, all the word of God, for all the people of God, isn't it? All right? And we have a responsibility to obey God's word. Do you know, I grew up in a family where we had uh, two brothers and two sisters. And, uh, well, my father gave us some, some orders and some commands. We had to do some things. Well, we had to be obedient to his word. And, and when we weren't obedient to his word, well, he wasn't very happy with us. All right? Now, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. As a local assembly, we have this responsibility to be faithful to the word of God. Now, we're living in very strange days, aren't we? We're living in days of compromise. 
we live in days of outer influence influencing the church right we have things creeping into the church which is foreign to the mind and the will of god we have new things being 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 introduced to the church which is not found in the word of god our oh, brethren and sisters are we being faithful to the word of god or are we being faithful to something else on the outside faithful to what we feel faithful to what what we think faithful to what modern living is like no 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 things change but god's word remains the same and as believers and as a church as a local testimony we recognize that we're there as a testimony to god we're showing the world out there with all its difficulties what god has installed for us a testimony for his honor for his glory and we're going to have to be like this early church to be responsible to the word of god and to be faithful to his word in this early church they were marked by repentance and faith responsiveness and following reception and fellowship and of course they had a responsibility to the word of god they continued steadfastly you know we could have just read there that they 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 followed the word no no it says they continued steadfastly there was something steadfast there was something certain about it there was a cost involved they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and praise my god help us in a day of declension in a day of apostasy where we see things being introduced to the church which is foreign to the word of god just to be faithful to god and to his word but then they were also marked with remembrance and focus we read there that they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and in the fellowship and we read there in the breaking of bread that's a lovely term that's a lovely term the breaking of bread brethren and sisters when we meet on a lord's day morning we come to the breaking of bread service that's a scriptural term it is referred to in god's word as the lord's supper let's try and keep to god's word and to the very things that god has called it. the breaking of bread they knew somewhat of remembrance and focus now what is the purpose of a breaking of bread service we've broken bread this morning isn't it why did we break bread all right our brother marcus read for us that when the lord jesus christ was there in that upper room he broke bread what did he say he said now listen do this in remembrance of me so i'm going to suggest brothers and sisters the first reason why we come together to break bread is in obedience to the request of the lord jesus christ so long ago to remember him all right what do we remember we remember all that he suffered and endured in our behalf we remember the purpose of his coming we remember the person who laid down his life at the cross of calvary we think of his sinless perfection we think of the perfect sacrifice at calvary we remember him weekly isn't it it's a wonderful thing you know i don't know about you but i i i get very cold very quickly and i'm very thankful that god has instituted this wonderful remembrance feast where week after week i can be focused again on the lord jesus christ the one who died at the cross of calvary but then what else do we do at a breaking of bread not only do we remember him the apostle paul says we show forth his death we show forth his death every time we break bread we are showing forth his death what are we doing we are really preaching the gospel by taking the bread and the cup isn't it we telling men and women we showing forth that 2000 years ago there was one who laid down his life as a sacrifice for sin and so we secondly we are showing forth his death we preaching the gospel without talking isn't that isn't that wonderful just by that symbol by breaking bread on a lord's day morning but then thirdly we have our focus on the second coming of christ because it says there 
we do it one time more and we do it one time less. Why? Because it says, do this until I come again. So there's three aspects to our breaking of bread, to remember him, to show forth his death and to recognize that the one who has promised to come will come. The Lord said, if I go, I will come again. That was the focus. They had their eyes fixed on the fact that the one who died at the cross of Calvary, the one who was buried, the one whom God raised from the dead, the one who ascended into the very heavens above, he is coming again. Brethren and sisters, are we living in the light of his coming? Do we recognize that he might come before this very meeting is over? Ah, oh, brethren and sisters, he's coming soon. He's coming soon. Brethren and sisters, he might come even today. Their remembrance and their focus. Now, what do we do as we remember him? Well, we remember his suffering. We remember his promises. We remember his work. And whilst we remember him, we offer up praise and worship, telling God of the worth of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Hebrew writer speaks about the fruits of our lips. And so as we leave this meeting throughout the whole of next week, we glean things from God's word about the Lord Jesus Christ. And on the next Lord's Day, we come with our baskets of first fruits to offer up praise and thanks and adoration for the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the responsibility of every member of the assembly. All right? God is seeking worshipers. And they that worship must worship in spirit and according to truth. It is foreign to the mind and the will of God, brethren and sisters, friends, to have a worship team in front leading us in worship. God wants the worship from every lip. Yes, in the assembly, there are different roles. There's the public roles of those who worship publicly. There are roles of those who worship inaudibly. But God expects from every heart praise and worship which ascends to the throne of God. Brethren and sisters, that's being part of a fellowship. When I go home every night and I glean from the scriptures, and the next week I bring something to God of value and worth for the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they were marked by remembrance and focus. But then we realized that they were a people that uh, 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 they were dependent on God. I'm going to suggest that they were marked by reliance and faith. Yes, repentance and faith, saving faith. Responsiveness and following, they were baptized. Reception and fellowship into the local church. Responsibility and faithfulness, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They remembered and their focus was on the returning one, the Lord Jesus Christ. But they were reliance, marked by reliance and faith. It says there, as a last point of the early church, they continued steadfastly in prayer. They recognized that they were totally reliant and dependent upon God. Brothers and sisters, we were taught in our younger days, a prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. All right? A prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. Can I ask you? How's your prayer life? The word of God teaches about personal prayer. And the Lord Jesus said, you go up into your closet and you close your door and you, and, you, and, you, and, you, and you seek the help of the Lord, recognizing your total dependence on him, recognizing the uselessness of self per se. And I've been in those circumstances where I had no way to turn to and recognize that it is only God that can help. Total reliance and dependence upon God. But as an assembly, because here we're thinking of the early church there is the responsibly, responsibility of collective prayer, all right? Now we have in the scriptures, you can turn to them. We don't have the time this morning. Go to 1 Timothy 2 
and read what God as Paul writes to Timothy about the church at Ephesus and how that they have the responsibility collectively to pray for all men, to pray for governments, to pray for society per se. And he's going to give instructions in 1 Timothy 8, uh, 2 verse 8. He says, now I will therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands. The early church, they were totally reliant and dependent on God. Their reliance and their faith as they lived daily, they were going to trust in God. This marked the early church. Members marked by repentance and faith. They were responsive and followed Christ as they obeyed God in baptism. They were received into the fellowship of the Lord's people. They were added to the church. There was a responsibility to continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in the breaking of bread and in the prayers. There was remembrance and focus. They broke bread and they did this in obedience to God. Then there was reliance and faith. They were totally dependent upon God. We thought of the members. Now, very, very quickly, just in closing, what about the mannerisms of the early church? We read in verse 43 there, and fear came upon every soul. I'm going to suggest, dear friends, this morning, believers, that they were marked by reverence for God. This wasn't a fear that, 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 that made them scared per se. Here was a reverential fear for God. Brethren and sisters, the word of God says, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. All right? We're living in a very casual day. There's no reverence for God. There's no reverence for his word. You know, the Lord God is just a little friend. All right? Brethren and sisters, the one whom we serve is God and God alone. He's a jealous God. He's a God who is a righteous and a holy God. Yes, we enjoy the grace and the mercy of God, but let's not lose our reverence for God. All right? Let's not use, lose our reverence for God. You look at the book of Malachi. The Lord's people, they lost their reverence for God, and God was displeased with that. They were marked by reverence. But then if you read through these verses here from verse 43 on to the end of the chapter, you will recognize they were a people who recognized that they needed to maintain unity. It says all were together and all had all things in, com in common and they continued daily. There was a continuation in the work of God maintaining unity. Now listen, brethren and sisters, we don't make the unity. The unity is made by the Spirit of God, but it is our responsibility individually to maintain the unity in the uniting bond of peace. The psalmist says, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Why? Because there the Lord is going to maintain a blessing. You and I are going to know the blessing of the Lord in the assembly. We need to maintain the unity. All right? I must be very, very careful that I don't go against God's word and cause disunity in the assembly. If I maintain God's word and I'm obedient to God's word, well, I'll be maintaining the unity. Here's the responsibility. They maintained the unity of God's word. Now, what was the result? Before the result, we read there that not only were they a people that reverenced God and maintained unity, we read there that they were happy worshiping people. All right? I love these verses. It says there they, they, they ate meat with gladness. They were happy people. In verse 47, it says they were praising God. You know, brethren and sisters, the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ should be a happy people. All right? You know, we shouldn't be walking around with long faces all the time, right? Sometimes we look at each other, we've got long faces all the time, brethren and sisters. I met somebody a week ago and all they could talk about is the lockdown and the, the virus and the vaccine and the government. And the, for half an hour, all I heard was the sadness and all. Brethren and sisters, we should be a happy people. 
right? We've been redeemed. Our sins have been washed away. We are names are written in the Lamb's book of life. We are, we are waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Christ of God. Brethren and sisters, we should be a happy, blessed people. We should tell the men and women, boys and girls, it doesn't matter what happens to me here in this world, all right? This world is not my home. Heaven is my home. I'm waiting for that moment when Christ will come and rapture the church. And so in the meanwhile, we take our eyes off the things of this time in this world and all the vaccines and the virus and the whatever. It doesn't bother us. Why? Our lives are in his hands. All right? Our lives are in his hands, brethren and sisters. We take our, this is what they did. They even sold their possessions. They weren't interested in the material things and the happenings of life. It says here, they ate with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. My brother, my sister, have we not got somewhat to praise? Have we got not so much to be happy about? We belong to Christ. What was the result of all of this? A people that reverenced God. A people that maintained God's word in unity. A happy people that worshipped, praised, and blessed God. It says in the last verse, here's the results. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Isn't that wonderful? God is in the work of saving, brethren and sisters, friends. And adding to the church, you ask the question, why have we not seen results? Maybe, brethren and sisters, because we have been unfaithful to God's word. Maybe because we are focused have been wrong. Maybe because we're walking around with a long face. I'm not sure about you, but when I see people with long faces, I try and go the other way, isn't it? Brethren and sisters, let's keep our eyes focused upon Christ and in obedience to his word. And we let the Lord do the saving and the adding to the church such as should be saved. The Lord bless everyone and his word to our hearts for his name's sake. Amen.